Good evening and namaste. I'm Suhag Shukla, the Hindu American Foundation's Executive Director, as well as co-counsel. I'm joined tonight by uh, Managing Director Samir Kalra and also co-counsel here at the Hindu American Foundation. Um, later on in the evening, we'll be joined by Mihir Megani, co-founder and member of HAF's Board of Directors. And uh, just want to say a thank you for uh, Krishna Parmar and Sheetal Shah who are helping backstage. So before we get started on this very important topic, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we will have a short presentation followed by a Q&A. We've had a number of questions that have already been sent in through the registration process that we will try to get to first. And if time permits, we will be using the Q&A feature so if you put questions in chat, we probably won't get them. Uh, but if you use the Q&A feature, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. And um, parts of this presentation, it's always a, a popular question whether this will be available online. Parts of this presentation will be made available on HAF's YouTube channel. Uh, someone will also be plugging in valuable HAF resources into the chat do take time to read those, study those, and share them with your friends and family as we discuss this very important issue. With that, we'll get started. So caste, cows, and karma, this is a predominant narrative that so many of us are familiar with. And today we're going to be talking about caste. Caste is one of the most complicated and misunderstood concepts encountered in attempts and in trying to understand India and Hindu teachings and traditions. And yet, even though it's complicated and misunderstood, caste and a caste system have become primary markers in the Western understanding of Indians and Hindus, and to some extent, even the internalized understanding of, of ourselves. So given that caste is such a complicated and poorly defined concept, um, we'll be using the term caste interchangeably with community tonight, both of which entail a variety of factors such as clan, class, language, dialect, lineage, uh, traditional occupation, and other highly locally recognizable markers. But from as early as sixth grade all the way to the daily news feeds that we have online, we see false and negative stereotypes and oversimplifications about caste and a caste system that are perpetuated through a variety of sectors. We see it in higher education. According to Professor Arvind Sharma, there's over 9,000 books that have been written about caste and the caste system with theories ranging from its origin to its immorality. In K through 12 textbooks, many of you have been following HAF's work. There has been a very inaccurate and stereotypical pyramid that has been presented as the way in which all Indians recognize one another and treat one another and the way in which Indian society has been set up since time immemorial and continues to be set up in that manner. In fact, our annual or our first ever bullying survey found that more than three out of five respondents said that their school focused on caste and Hinduism, including claims about uh, caste discrimination being integral to the religion and uh, that no distinction between Indian social realities and the Hindu tradition. And of course, the media. Over the past two years, there has been an average of probably one to two articles, if not more, discussing the purportedly widespread nature of caste-based discrimination in the United States, which we'll talk about more later. And many of these articles have been written by Indians from or in India who don't understand the lived realities and lived experiences of Indians and Hindus in this country as micro minorities and often map Indian realities onto ours. And those that are written by non-Indians very often suffer from perpetuating inaccurate and false tropes about us. Perhaps most disturbingly is a new trend of these types of policies being institutionalized at the university setting and beyond. But before we delve into that a little bit further, I think it's very important for us to speak very, very clearly and unequivocally that we all stand together against any form of discrimination, whether it is caste-based or any other form, and we share the goal of eradica eradicating it wherever it may exist. 
And as Hindus, we are informed by teachings that share the, the idea of equal regard for everyone and oneness of all beings, not just humans, but all living forms. And so those that would accuse us of being forecast or wanting to take these policies out or try to have a better understanding around caste so we can discriminate is absolutely preposterous. And those accusations are false and um, very, very disturbing. But to get into kind of a little bit more of the, uh, the substance of this, you know, one of the problems about caste is that it is one of the most persistent false and negative stereotypes about Indians and specifically Hindus. Now, if you were to ask any Hindu on the street, you know, what is the first thing you think, of, or sorry, any non-Hindu on the street about Hinduism or about Hindus, the first thing they'll say is, oh, you believe in the caste system. So it is, it is perhaps the most single uh, negative stereotype about our community. And the fact that it is now being institutionalized through non-discrimination policies and college campuses across the United States brings up a lot of questions. First of all, will it spread beyond the university system? There are also indications that it could be spreading into places like corporations. We saw the Cisco case, of course. Um, we've heard of other instances as well. Um, there is a county level in the Bay Area uh, in Northern California, Santa Clara County, and perhaps even at the state level. Um, so this is something that is not just confined to one place in the university setting, but has the possibility and the, uh, and the potential to really impact all aspects of our life, whether we're, ch we're children in schools, whether we're university students, whether we're working at a corporation, or just living in a county or any, any particular state in this country. And this will have devastating impacts on us for years to come. So talking about college campuses, we all may know about what's happened recently with the California State University system. And there are two aspects of what's been going on at the CSU system. Now, this is one of the largest, largest college camp uh, systems in California with 23 campuses across the state. And CAST has been added to non-discrimination policies in two specific areas. The first was done through a student-led uh, resolution and then later adopted by the Board of Trustees that was broadly uh, applicable to all students and all people on, at the CSU system and added CAS as a specific category, separate from any other categories that already exist on race, gender, disability, ethnicity, or national origin. The second uh, aspect of the CSU system that we saw recently was when the collective bargaining agreement or the contract between faculty members at the CSU system and the board of trustees added CAST again into their collective bargaining agreement. That means that any faculty or staff member in their contract now will see CAST as a separate category for non-discrimination policies. So that impacts their actual livelihood, that impacts hiring and firing um, and promotions within the Cal State University system. The other example is that we've seen it at UC Davis, uh, which is part of the University of California system in California as well. And there have been other campuses across the country, including Brandeis, Colby College, and Harvard University. Now, beyond the Cal State or any of these university systems, we've also seen attempts to implement it at the county level. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Santa Clara County, which is in the heart of Silicon Valley, uh, was brought a, brought a proposal where it was considering adding CAS to their county non-discrimination policies. Now, this would affect residents of the county. This would affect students in the county and schools in the county. This would have affected anybody working in, cor in a corporate setting in Santa Clara County. So again, you see that the impact and the potential harm is very widespread. Now, throughout all of this, whether at the CSU system or at Santa Clara County, HF worked with other community groups, other leaders, professors, faculty, um, and interfaith groups to really try to uh, address this issue and address it head on in a way that we were clear that we don't want our community to be singled out or targeted. We again, we are against discrimination, but even if it exists, that does not mean that a whole new category needs to be created that would only affect our community. At Santa Clara County, we were successful. Um, unfortunately, at the CSU system, uh, it didn't go through and they still adopted the resolution and the uh, contract, but we are still exploring other options to continue the fight in that particular uh, case. So, uh, so Samir has kind of given you an overview of all that's happening and California really is ground zero when it comes to institutionalizing caste and non-discrimination policies. 
And sadly, this isn't the first time that the state has created policies that single out and target a particular group on the basis of who they are or who they're perceived to be. So I wanna give a little bit of historical context. Um, first, we can look back to the 1800s. In 1850, the state of California had passed the foreign miners tax. It imposed a monthly fee of $20 on California born Mexicans and foreign immigrants for the right to mine. In today's dollars, that's probably around $700 a month simply to mine. This was, of course, in the heart uh, of in the central time of the, the gold rush. San Francisco instituted the Cubic Air Ordinance of 1870. This directly targeted Chinese immigrants living in the city's overcrowded Chinatown by requiring 500 cubic feet of air for every person living in a particular space. They knew that Chinese immigrants were living many people to a particular building or residence, and this was a way to target them under the guise of fresh air. The California Land Act, Alien Land Laws of 1913 and 1920 prohibited aliens ineligible for citizenship, basically Asians um, as well as Indians, from being able to own agricultural land or possess leases, long-term leases. So this bill, while it was intended to target just Japanese immigrants, it impacted Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Indian immigrant farmers throughout the state. Now, these laws were all passed by nativist Californians that preceded the U.S. Constitution's 14th Amendment, which conferred the rights of due process and equal protection to all people. So it would be hard to imagine that a law targeting a particular immigrant group at the, the passage of the 14th Amendment, and especially today in a, an environment of California's progressive politics that prioritizes diversity and inclusion, that we're seeing this happening. But the problem and the sad thing is, is that California's dark history appears to be repeating itself. And this time it's targeting Indians, South Asians, and Hindus. So I wanna talk a little bit about equal protection. I mentioned it quickly that, you know, the xenophobic laws of the past came about, came into being prior to the, to, uh, the 14th Amendment, which extended the rights of equal protection and due process um, through the states for all people. So what are civil liberties? What are civil rights? Some of them you might be familiar with, free speech, our right to the free freedom of the press, freedom to assemble, freedom of religion. So those are all in, um, encompassed or ensconced in the First Amendment. The US Constitution and various state laws like the Civil Rights Act also uh, end up becoming kind of the conduit to ensure that the US Constitution's 14th Amendment that promises equal protection and due process actually happen. So what is equal protection? Sound, it, it is what it sounds like, that the state cannot treat people differently. And what is due process? This is one of those topics that we spend many, many hours, probably semesters learning about, and because it can, uh, can manifest in different uh, contexts, but it's basically that the state can't deprive individuals of general fairness and justice. So I want to talk about discrimination before talking about where discrimination is outlawed. So discrimination is the unfair or prejudicial treatment of people and groups based on certain characteristics in certain contexts. So one of the primary laws that actually affect all of us in our day-to-day -day, um, existence in this country, and sometimes we may not even be aware of it, and that's part of the purpose of us gathering today, is that we need to know our rights and responsibilities under the laws of this country. So take a look at the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, this particular act essentially was a means by which uh, the states, as well as various um, contexts like uh, employment um, in institutions that are receiving federal funding, which is um, generally um, colleges and universities or public schools, public accommodations like restaurants and hotels would live up to the promise, a promise that our country has time and time again fallen short of. Um, so Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlaws discrimination. It provides the broad contours of the characteristics that, are, um, that protect certain classes. So you have race, color, religion, sex, 
um, and national origin. And then I already talked about the context in which discrimination is not allowed. We're gonna be largely talking about the workplace uh, because we're seeing this at CSU and it's going to impact faculty members and staff members um, who are employees of that institution. And it may also uh, bring in Title VI and aspects of that, which protect students um, from um, discrimination uh, on their college campuses. As I said before, our country has not lived up to these ideals that are in, ensconced in our constitution. And indeed, America has fallen short. But our country is a work in progress. And the, the health of our nation rests on these broad principles that have the ability to respond as our country grows increasingly in diversity. So that's why we've gathered here tonight and we'll be doing so many more times because it's critical that people in our community know what's going on, know their rights and responsibilities and have the tools to be able to speak out against any sorts of violations of our most fundamental rights. We're probably facing what arguably is the single most important civil rights issue or challenge that our community has faced in a generation. And that's why we really appreciate your presence here tonight. So how is the addition of caste exactly discriminat discriminatory? Well, first of all, it again targets and singles out people of Indian origin, or if you want to expand that out, South Asian origin, and particularly Hindus, uh, based on their ethnicity and religion. Now, it's both discriminatory in its intent and its implementation. Um, and we'll get into a little bit of that um, in, in a few minutes. But to start with, laws that are um, passed in, in this country need to be what's called facially neutral. They cannot be facially discriminatory. When we say facially neutral, what do we mean? We mean broad categories, race, national origin, color, religion, gender, sexual orientation. So for instance, under race, it applies to people of all races. A white, uh, a white employee can sue an African-American boss. Uh, a Mexican-American employee can sue a Chinese boss and vice versa. So there's no distinction based on your race. It's just race as a very broad category. Similarly for national origin, color, religion, gender or sexual orientation, even under gender. Well, there may be statistics that show that uh, female employees are discriminated against more in the workplace than their male counterparts. This law, does, laws around gender discrimination still do not distinguish between males and females. So a male employee can again bring a harassment charge against or discrimination charge against a female boss or vice versa. Uh, so there again is no distinction there. Now, if you contrast that with what people are trying to do around caste and how they're trying to add caste as a protected category. That is facially discriminatory. Now, you, people may think that if you're looking at the Indian context, well, you know, anybody under India's caste laws can bring cases or claims. Now, there may be a presumption of guilt in certain um, situations, but an OBC can, you know, bring a charge against somebody of a different caste uh, and vice versa. It doesn't matter. But when we're talking about caste in the American context, we know that caste will only apply to Indians and Hindus. You're not going to see a claim by an Arab American or a Chinese American or any other group on caste-based discrimination because, again, caste is only associated with Indians and Hindus and South Asians more broadly. So again, it's discriminat discriminatory on its face. It's the equivalent of saying, you know, we have identified that there are some tribal um, issues of potentially tribal discrimination between um, Bedouins and uh, people from Peninsula or Saudi Arabia existing in a particular industry in the U.S. Does that mean now we're going to add to the to the list of our laws something that deals with no discrimination between Bedouin and uh, Peninsula or Saudi Arabians? Or you know, the list can go on and on and on and on. And that's why it's very important to have neutral laws on their face. Uh, but CAS is not one of those. Now. Um, you know, the other thing that you just want to note here is that people will say that, you know, well, you know, we see it effective in India and it's necessary to stamp out this problem. Again, I just want to reiterate that we're not saying that there may not be issues of caste-based discrimination, but what is the solution to that? Is it to create a separate law around it that is, that just discriminates just from being in place? Just the existence of the law, if it only targets one community, is discrimination. 
Or is it better to try to use one of these other categories that we see here, such as national origin, for instance, or ethnicity, or ancestry? And so that is a question before us, not whether there may or may not be issues of caste-based discrimination, but how do we create laws and policies around that? And so Hog is gonna start a little bit talking about the discriminatory intent behind some of this. So uh, thanks, Samir. You know, when we talk about discriminatory intent, um, we're looking at the individuals or the, the decision makers who are behind um, implementing or instituting these policies. So where we're seeing that the, the intent behind these are discriminatory is that underlying these policies, whether it's at CSU or other institutions, is that there's a presumption that Indians and South Asians are so inherently bigoted or so problematic that we require a departure from well-established legal principles to create a special policy that only applies to or targets Indians, or that subjecting our community to basically a form of ethno-religious monitoring and policing in a manner that no other ethnic group or religious group is subjected to is somehow justified. So how do we know this? Well, first, because none of the institutions in our conversations with faculty, say at CSU, um, none of the decision makers were able to respond to faculty with evidence that there had been complaints of caste-based discrimination filed on their college campuses. More importantly, if they were filed, which they could not come up with any examples, they could not say or answer why existing policies could not cover it or find an example that existing policy had failed to provide redress or protection. Many of these policies have also been justified on the basis of manipulated and falsified data. So I'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, and there are no policies in place, for example, that would apply to only Chinese Americans or to Jewish Americans or anybody else. So in the absence of evidence of widespread caste-based discrimination, and more importantly, in the absence of evidence that existing policies would fail to provide protection and redress to any such complaints, all of these policies then rest on a, the prejudicial ideas and assumptions about a group of people based on who we are or who we're perceived to be. Next slide. So I mentioned manipulated and falsified data. Where is this coming from? Many of you who have been following the story on the media have probably come across the name Equality Labs because this tends to be the one authoritative survey that is presenting caste-based discrimination as having been widespread. Now keep in mind, we're talking about 1.3% of the entire US population. While we might have representation in tech and education and, and in, in other spheres, we are still numerically a micro minority. So a little bit about Equality Labs. It's an activist company that's created the illusion of a problem. It's then aggressively pushed for policies to address a, the purported problem using backdoor access through scholar allies. And then it stands to profit because it offers trainings on CAST. So what I want you to do is pay attention to what one of the leading and only scientifically validated surveys um, that, are, that is available on Indian American uh, attitudes says. What they pointed out is that the Equality Lab survey is not one that has been conducted in a scientific manner. In, in contrast, the Carnegie survey which included researchers from the Carnegie Endowment um, for International Peace from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as Johns Hopkins. It conducted the largest scientifically validated study ever completed on Indian American attitudes in partnership with the data analytics firm YouGov. Now, even this data is imperfect in the sense that they, it's a subset of a larger sample. And they did not ask questions related to caste in spite of the fact that they acknowledge that there are caste identities present amongst uh, Indians of uh, Christian or Muslim or other backgrounds. But what they found was that while more than half of Indians reported facing discrimination on the basis of color, gender, national origin, 
the instances of people reporting having faced caste-based discrimination were exceedingly rare. We're talking about less than 5% of that 1.3% if you um, expand the numbers out. Um, so the other thing I wanna point out is that little, little over half of the respondents did not uh, that responded that they did not identify by caste. And then as you dig down into the numbers, um, those who were born and raised here uh, are shown to identify by caste or know their caste with even less frequency. So we know that caste identities um, lose their relevance with every generation. Now, and that is something that, you know, even in the absence of a survey, I think that many of us can attest to this reality just based on our own lived experiences. I want to also just point out, it's not just a matter of, you know, a snowballing um, sample size or and other issues that um, we've pointed out in an article that we wrote um, when the survey originally came out, I think in 2017 or 2018, there's issues of confirmation bias. There's also um, a real deep anti-Hindu hatred that's steeped through this report. The survey is imbued with bias and hatred. It perpetuates the most noxious and false trope about Hinduism, conflating discrimination or trying to present discrimination as some sort of fundamental teaching and practice. Um, it also blames the existence of uh, caste prejudices in other religious communities on Hinduism, even though these traditions and, and the adherents have moved away from Hinduism, oftentimes for thousands of years. Um, it also has portrayed very common Hindu practices, such as attending a temple or practicing vegetarianism as somehow being signals of casteism. They've also portrayed Diwali and Holi as casteist holidays. Now imagine the impact on students that you have an organization that had the sort of access to the highest leadership in these institutions and pushed through a policy that now singles out and targets them. And at the same time, they have portrayed some of their most sacred holidays inaccurately as being castes. How safe are Hindu students and faculty going to feel on college campuses to practice their tradition, to celebrate their holidays? These are the types of real impacts that could result as a result of, uh, because of the direction that CSU has gone. So in addition to discriminatory, discriminatory impact, sorry, intent, the implementation of any policy is a huge question. It's easy to say, okay, we wanna create a law, we wanna create a policy that's gonna deal with a particular issue. And that policy may be very short but the regulations or the guidance on how that's implemented can be extremely long. And how do you get around that when caste is only again associated with Indians and Hindus? How do you define caste? Um, how do you not have bias against Indians and Hindus in any setting? And how do you, who are you gonna rely on? Who are, if people are going to be implementing policies around caste, who are they gonna rely on? They're gonna rely on quote unquote caste experts who we already know are biased in their interpretation of Hinduism and their view of Indian society and Indian Americans here in the US. So the implementation is probably the most important aspect of all of this. So if you are, let's say you're working in a corporate setting in Silicon Valley, how are they going to define caste in their policies, right? That you can just say caste, non-discrimination based on caste, but how are you gonna define it? When you are hiring a new employee or, in, in, or interviewing them, are they going to have to check boxes that talk about what caste they are? How long is that list gonna be? Because in India, there are thousands of categories. Um, is it gonna rely on uh, experts that are basing it on India? So how's all that gonna have a day-to-day -day impact on, um, on us here in the US, especially when caste is not clearly defined. There is no universally accepted definition of caste. Even people that are promoting adding caste and non-discrimination policies can't agree on it. So you ask hundred Hindus, they're all gonna tell you something different about caste, not to speak of non-Hindus. So again, how do you define it? How do you implement it? How does it actually play out on a day-to-day -day basis? We talked a lot about the employment setting, but if you are applying for colleges, 
are you going to have to mark down what uh, caste that you are? Are you going to have to, what happens if you don't know your caste? What happens if you're not even of Indian descent? So these are all the questions that these policymakers at the university setting and at the county level have not even thought about. Or if they have thought about it, they don't care about the impact that it's gonna have on our community. But these are real issues that we have to be concerned about. Now, what you're not gonna see is you're not gonna see any um, Arab American, Chinese American, Muslim American having to deal with the same questions. And slowly over time, what's, what we're gonna see is we're gonna see less and less Indian Hindus in some of these uh, corporate settings, in the university settings, or we're gonna see a number of cases of false accusations of discrimination that are lodged against these individuals. So by trying to solve a problem while people may be well-intentioned, and I'm not saying they're always well-intentioned, we're creating a whole nother issue of discrimination, both in how you are uh, creating these policies, but also how you're implementing them and administering them. So, but people would ask, okay, if we're not discriminating, does it really matter? It doesn't matter at all. Well, it does matter because, you know, just by saying that um, if, we, if we don't have a problem with discrimination, that we should now create policies um, that, you know, will target uh, millions of people in this country. So it absolutely does, absolutely does matter. And that is not a justification to say that, you know, for people that are promoting caste policies to say that, well, you shouldn't care if you're not discriminating, how, are you, how is it gonna impact you? We don't know that. We don't know that it's not gonna impact us. So these are things that are not well thought out. These are things that are not even well studied in this country to understand how extensive the problem may or may not be. So, uh, so what do we do? You know, for those people who have faced some sort of discrimination on the basis of who they're perceived to be, what community they're perceived to be from. There is a solution to these acts of caste-based discrimination when and if they're happening. And that is first and foremost, universities and corporations need to educate all students, faculty, and their employers of the strong and comprehensive existing laws that already, already cover things like national origin. As Samir talked about earlier, national origin already includes aspects such as background, ancestry, birth, uh, accent. These are all a variety of factors that could be associated with caste identities. So we need to educate people and be more aware of what existing law requires of us, as well as what it protects us from, and then use those laws. Um, if you're facing something, then you should go and file a complaint. Learn what the, how the system works, what your rights are, as well as what your responsibilities are. Now, the problem is, is that in spite of existing policies already covering a wide range of social identities, CSU has chosen to render all South Asians as is inherently bigoted a suspect class of inherently bigoted people that requires a special anti-discrimination category. That is discrimination by its very nature. So before we move on to Q and A's, what can you do? I mean, all of this can be um, overwhelming. Um, it can be scary. Um, and so there are a number of things that you can do. All of these interventions and the advocacy um, that HAF and many other Hindu organizations have been involved in are opportunities for us to learn and protect our rights and to educate our own community, to educate policymakers and to educate the public at large about who we are and what we stand for. And while HAF and others are fighting for your rights, um, even where most of the community has been largely unaware of the threats that we're facing, it's critical that you take action. And there's a number of things that you can do. First, you can educate yourself and your children. Um, know your rights and responsibilities in this country. Know that existing policy prohibits discrimination on the basis of ancestry and descent, which could cover caste in the same way that those categories cover tribe, sect, or clan. Also, you should learn about the history of caste and we have some wonderful resources that are just a starting place because we don't know our own history. 
we know from our own lived experiences of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis here in our life and also what we may have witnessed in India. We need to be able to comprehend that. And there's a number of scholars who have done uh, a tremendous amount of work in digging through archives and understanding better what Indian society was all about. And we owe it to ourselves to also learn about that. We'll also be launching a How to Talk About Caste Dharma Ambassadors program. Um, this pilot is scheduled for it March and it will be offered in an ongoing basis so that after you learn about um, all the different complexities, because we too have been, um, in, we too have kind of internalized this very oversimplistic understanding of what um, caste is because it's through a lens that has oversimplified, falsely stereotyped and negatively stereotyped Indian society. Most importantly, be dharmic. Uphold satya, ahimsa, vivek, and vairagya. Truth, compassion, discernment, and objectivity in all our thoughts, our words, and our actions. This is what it means to be Hindu. Our tradition mandates samadrishti, or looking upon and treating one another with equal regard, as well as ekatva, or living in accordance with the acknowledgement that we all have a shared oneness. These are all things that are well within your reach. You're already living um, in this country and contributing positively and inspired by our tradition. And we need to continue to do that, but articulate it to our friends and neighbors, what motivates us to be good and to do good. What is HAF doing? We have created a number of educational media resources that I saw that some of our fellow staff members have been sharing. Um, we are actively reaching out to journalists who are covering these emerging stories to ensure that our perspective and our concerns are heard. We're also working directly with faculty, not only at CSU, but other universities that are facing um, this uh, civil rights challenge and helping them explore all their legal avenues and to advocate for their rights. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, uh, we appreciate all the comments and um, look forward to a continued conversation on this very important topic. Again, please do uh, read and review and do your own research. Uh, the resources that we've created, such as the caste conundrum or the racist history of the caste system are meant to just start a journey of self-learning. Read the uh, academic articles that are cited there um, and, and learn for yourself because with knowledge comes confidence and our ability to dispel ignorance. And with that, we bid you namaste. Thank you, namaste.